Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the webinar, How to Effectively Apply Granular Baits, brought to you by Syngenta. My name is Marshall Gaster. I am the Market Manager for Pest Management uh, here at Syngenta. And uh, before we get to our speakers, I want to do a few house cleaning items. Um, first off, uh, we'll be, we are recording the webinar for, for, for future use. Uh, we'll probably be posting it to our website, SyngentaPMP.com, uh, in the future. Uh, the second thing is we'll hold questions for our panelists uh, towards the end. If you have a question, you can use the Q&A function within Zoom. Um, it should be right at the bottom of your screen <clears throat> to, to ask questions. You can ask questions throughout the presentation, uh, and they'll, ca they'll be captured and everything, and then we'll moderate a session towards the end. So with that, I'm going to get to a quick introduction. So we have all three of our technical um, technical service managers for Syngenta on the phone today. Uh, they will be doing uh, the presentation talking about how to apply uh, insect granular baits, uh, specifically Avion insect granular bait, which we just launched um, earlier this month. Um, first will be Eric Payson. Eric Payson covers our, uh, our western region, so basically like California all the way uh, butting up to Texas. Uh, following Eric will be Nikki Gallagher, who covers our Midwest and Northeast area. And then finally will be Chris Kiefer, who covers Texas all the way to Florida and kind of up to Virginia. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Okay. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're at. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this uh, seminar today. Hopefully everybody gets something out of it. Um, Marshall, if I could get that first slide, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to take a couple seconds before I dive into the slides on, on my presentation to kind of share my first experience with Avion insect granules. Um, about eight years ago, I was technical director for a great company uh, down in Southern California. And we had acquired a business out in Palm Springs. And it's a little bit different geography than we were used to, different pests. And um, the first spring that rolled around after that acquisition, we were just absolutely being murdered with, with trouble calls, uh, mostly for crickets, outdoor roaches, scorpions. And it, it, was, it was pretty bad. Um, a lot of upset customers. So I basically packed my bag, left my family behind, and moved out to Palm Springs in the summer, which was uh, a pretty pretty warm experience, just to try to figure out what was going on out there and, and get a handle on it in terms of our protocols. And over, over lunch one day with the local rep, Nick Grisafi, I was kind of sharing you know, with him my problems and picking his brain, and he suggested Avion insect granules, and it wasn't something that was really on my radar um, in terms of the solutions that I was, I was looking at. And I had a branch manager who, who actually had a property in Palm Springs that we were, we were struggling with, with these pests, mainly, maybe mainly crickets and, uh, and cockroaches. And so I, I got a sample from Nick. We took it out there, made the application. And the next day, I had a call from the manager who was just laughing. And he said, man, you just won't believe this. There's dead crickets and cockroaches all over my sidewalks. I had to get out the leaf blower to blow them away. So um, that, was, that was a pretty reassuring uh, first step. So we rolled it onto some routes, and it, it really did help with alleviating some of the, the issues we've been struggling with with some of these accounts. But the real difference was the next spring, um, you know, we made an attempt to get ahead of the trouble calls this time. So just as things started to warm up, we rolled those, uh, those granules out onto those routes, trained all the technicians, and the, the difference was just remarkable. I mean, it, it really changed the game for us out there. Um, you know, we, we were not overwhelmed with all those trouble calls, and the big surprise was that as we got later into to spring and into early summer, um, we had actually seen a big reduction in the scorpion trouble calls, which just wasn't something that I had really anticipated, you know, because a, a granule bait, isn't going to directly kill something like a predator that's a scorpion that's going to be eating those live insects. But you take their prey items away, which are primarily crickets and cockroaches, and um, those scorpions will move on to greener pastures when there's just nothing to eat during that time of year when they're, they're looking for prey. So um, 
you know, the, the product really kind of changed things for me, and I've, I've been a really big advocate for uh, granule baits in perimeter pest control ever since. And two and a half years ago when I joined the Syngenta team, I was really happy to finally be on the team that, that designed this product and put it together, and, um, and now I get to support it. And so today we're really excited about our newest formulation of an insect granular bait, the Avion insect granule bait. Um, product that we're going to be talking about today. So now, now just to kind of jump into the slide deck here, um, of course the product is highly effective um, at reducing or eliminating a wide range of perimeter pests. Um, it's reliable control. We've tested this product, you know, from its conception all the way to bringing it to market with third-party researchers at universities and independent contractors as well as in, internally. And then, as I mentioned, the secondary effects on predator pests, um, like scorpions and spiders, um, are well documented. In fact, we've got in our scorpion assurance program, um, the use of avion insect granules is, is part of that program. Um, some of the, the other things that I really like about the, the product and this application type is, you know, that it's easy to apply. There's no heavy backpack um, or sprayer hose that you're having to manage when making these applications. You know, in my experience in the industry, the most workers' comp claims that we saw were actually associated with backpacks, you know, with lifting and putting those backpacks on, as well as the carpal tunnel um, that you see when techs are, are just spraying all day. So to give a, a technician a break um, with some light work to do, like using a, a spreader, especially these new electronic spreaders, um, can help to break up that monotony and maybe reduce some of those injuries. And then the sprayer hose as well. You know, power rig sprayer hose is the number one uh, cause of customer damage. You know, whether it's just a little sprinkler riser or it's a really expensive, uh, you know, piece of ceramics or something that a customer has out in their, their yard. So um, a, lot of, a lot of damage happens there. And you just don't have those concerns with, with a granular insecticide. Um, no mixing as well, so it's a ready-to-use product, and it takes really very little time. You know, to make that perimeter application um, just takes a few minutes. And, you know, in terms of convenience, this, this new formulation, the new product comes in a one-pound shaker and a 12-pound bag. So we've really um, thought this through. We've packaged it specifically for PMPs that are making these perimeter applications. And, you know, I want to just encourage you, if you've never thought of using a granular bait um, as part of a, a protocol for perimeter pests, it's, it's something you should really take a look at. And a lot of folks confuse granular baits with granular insecticides. So, so what we're talking about here today is a bait, um, very different from something like um, Demand G or Talstar, which is a contact insecticide. So insects are attracted to these baits. Um, they will actually pick them up, eat them, uh, carry them back to their colony if that's the case. And you can actually wipe out entire populations with a bait where a, a contact is just going to kill those insects that happen to trail across a residual. Um, you know, the other thing that's really beneficial about uh, the entire Avion brand is the meta-active effect that's, that's present in the active ingredient um, in these products. Next slide, Marshall, please. So the meta-active effect, if you haven't heard of this um, previously, as I mentioned, it, it is something that's built into the entire Avion brand. So if you've got anything that says Avion on it, you know that this meta-active effect is at work. And, and what this is, is that in doxycarb itself, um, in the, the form when it's in the package, it actually has very, very low toxicity. And that endoxicarb molecule is actually activated or cleaved or broken down by enzymes that are specifically within the insect's um, digestive system. So these products have to, have to get inside of a target pest before really the manufacturing process is complete. So we, you know, we make, make it almost all the way done and then we allow the insects to, to finish that last stage of the chemistry for us. And at that point, it becomes highly toxic, and it's already inside of that target pest. So the, the real benefit there is that non-targets, especially mammals, just do not possess those enzymes. And so much less likely to be affected 
um, by the product, even if it is ingested. And that's why um, these endoxicarb products have been uh, granted EPA reduced risk status. So, you know, in terms of something to use around people's homes, businesses, kids, pets, things like that, um, this meta-active effect can really give you that peace of mind that you can share with your customers. Next, please. So just a little overview. So there's, unfortunately, there's a little bit of confusion um, in, our, in our product line here because the original Avion insect granule, which is on the left, um, is, is still going to be available um, and is, is still a product that, that you could purchase. It's a, it's a great product. It's a product I originally fell in love with, but um, please be aware that it is a very, very different product from the new Avion insect granular bait that, we're, that we've just recently launched. Um, so just a little uh, mnemonic that, to help you remember as you're ordering. Um, if it's blue, it's new. So our tech team came up with that. Can't, can't take credit for that one. Um, Nikki, Nikki was the brain behind that. But so as, you, as you're ordering, um, wherever you get your product, make sure that the, the label and the package has that blue font, and then you'll know that you're purchasing the, the new product. So just, just some, to get into kind of some of the differences between the old product and the new product, um, the old product is really more of a broadcast um, application technique, where the new um, granule bait is really a perimeter band or a spot treatment. So this is, this is specifically targeting uh, professional pest control, um, where the original product is more turf oriented um, originally. So the rate has also changed quite a bit too. So 1.15 pounds per thousand square feet was for um, ants, mole crickets, occasional invaders um, on the original and 2.3 per thousand for cockroaches. Those rates are dropped significantly due to the high palatability and high effectiveness of the new bait. So that's reduced down to 0.3 eight pounds or only six ounces per thousand for ants and occasional invaders and it jumps up to 1.15 um, for cockroaches just those larger bodied um, insects but the real benefit here is that it's less product for you to haul around on your truck it's less product to have to put out and you know i i was involved personally in a lot of our field trials and we were testing uh, this product and i think that the amount is just right i used a the Wiz, the um, battery-powered spreader, and um, you know, after measuring out the square feet, once I got through two or three accounts, it just felt very second nature. So I think you're really going to like the the use rates. It's, it's very intuitive. And then the key pest. So so basically, what we have listed here is everything that's on the label. But what's highlighted in in the bold is really what we recommend using each of these products for. So on the original Avion Insect Granule. Um, that's still the best product for mole crickets. So if you're doing broadcast applications in lawn type of settings for mole crickets, um, that, that's your product to go to. Really for everything else that a professional pest management uh, professional will deal with is, is what we're going to recommend for the new Avion insect granule bait with the blue label. So primarily we're targeting ants, cockroaches, crickets, and then earwigs and silverfish as well. Packaging is different as well, 25-pound bag still in the original, and uh, the 12-pound uh, and 1-pound uh, bottle that I mentioned on the new one. So next slide, please, Marshall. This is just a close-up photo that I took of, um, of these granules. And um, you can see that it's, you know, it, it not only are we saying it's different, it's, it's very different. And, this new product actually contains um, very high quality food ingredients that would be um, insect proteins, uh, carbohydrates, and lipids. So it's a really, really balanced uh, diet. It's very well thought out. And, you know, and then the original insect granule has, um, looks more like crumbs where the new, new product is actually extru extruded um, through an extruder. Uh, next, please. So um, highly attractive bait matrix, and we're speaking specifically here um, to the new product, which you can see in the, the spreader there. That's the Wiz that I mentioned. Um, really nice um, combination with that spreader. And I know there are other electric battery-powered spreaders as well, but I think technicians are really going to love applying this product um, through that, that device. 
Um, more attractive, so we've increased pest mortality at lower rates, and that's why we are able to reduce that, that rate that you saw on, on the previous comparison slide. Um, we've also expanded the pest list. Um, tawny crazy ants, which if you're not in that part of the country dealing with those, I know you've heard of them. So a really tough pest, very small ant, um, and we've added ants and, and things like that to this label. Um, it's a it's a true insect bait. So this thing was was thought from the ground up to hit as many pests as we can. I'm really pleased with the results we're seeing on ants. Um, like I said, it's it's extruded, and the big benefit there is that it's going to produce minimal dust during application. So it's a very clean um, application, um, and it's it's really consistent. So I, I think it's going to be just a real pleasure to apply. Next. So this is a study. Um, this was kind of an eye opener for me. So I was, you know, I think you've gotten the picture that I really love the old, the old product, but it wasn't something that I really thought to go to for ants. And with this new formulation that, that we've got here, um, it's, it's highly effective on ants, so much that I, I, was, I was very surprised. Um, I answer really my specialty or passion, you might say. Um, so this was, this was a really fun project for me. Um, we, we did this at UCR, at University of California in River, at Riverside, which is really an epicenter for where we're dealing with really tough um, Argentine ant problems. And things like um, Fipronil and, and other products are actually on kind of a hit list with the California Department of, of Pesticide Regulation. Um, just due to overuse and combating this, this ant. So UCR was very interested in looking for alternatives. And um, so we, we came up with some protocols and, uh, you know, the work was all done by, by University of California at Riverside. Um, they did the applications. They found the, the volunteers that, that wanted to participate in the study. And if you want to look closer at this, um, the, the article was actually published uh, about seven months ago in PCT magazine. So you could just Google up um, the title here, which is a closer look, Argentine Ant Control, PCT magazine, and online you can read the full version of this. Um, next slide, please. So basically we had three treatments um, involving um, OptiGuard Flex and the Avion WDG liquids uh, along with gel baits and then the Avion insect granular bait. Next, please. We were looking at five homes per, per each of these, so it was a total of 16 homes. The light green bar that you see here is the control. So those were the, um, the people that unfortunately did not receive any treatment at their home. Um, and the UCR has a really uh, involved protocol for how they monitor the ant activity. Um, they put out sugar baits and they actually are able to calculate the exact number of, of feedings that they've had on those. Um, so it's a pretty sophisticated study done by those guys. And you can see that by week one in those controls, they had more ants than they did at the beginning. Um, but in, across all of our treatments, um, we saw uh, really nice reductions in Argentine ants. And that went out as far out as eight weeks, which, you know, if, you're, if you've done work on those ants in that part of the country, um, you know that that's, that's tough, and it, it takes a really well-designed program to be able to accomplish that. So we were really proud of these results, and uh, the folks at UCR were thrilled to have some options that they could recommend, um, you know, through the extension service that were products that are basically completely off of the radar in terms of misuse and, and you know, regulatory restrictions that might be pending. Uh, next, please. So just to go a little bit into the label, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. Um, we already touched on it, but the lowest label rate for uh, ants, crickets, earwigs, and silverfish is that 0.38 pounds, which is only six ounces per thousand square feet. Um, and then the lowest label rate for cockroaches, if you're going for cockroaches, you are going to have to increase that up to 1.15 pounds per thousand square feet. And the, um, the table that's, that's on your, your right here we'll kind of break that down in terms of making it easier for you to gauge how much you should be putting out. So that one, that pounds of product for 100 linear feet 
is going by the seven foot um, wide perimeter band that the label recommends for, for doing perimeter work. Um, so that's kind of where you can go um, in terms of, you know, it's a lot easier to measure uh, linear feet than to, to paste stuff off and measure by thousand if you like it to do it that way. Um, but either way, I think you'll find the, the rates are very intuitive. And then one thing I want to point out um, in this, this table, which will probably blow some of you away, is that the max label rate um, for, per thousand square feet is all the way up to 4.6 pounds. So that would be a massive application, but if you're dealing with any kind of really out of control or special situation, you can use a lot of this product uh, and still stay within label specifications. Um, you shouldn't need that much, but you know, I, I know how it is. We run into some crazy situations out there and um, you, can, you can really go after it with this product. Uh, next, please. Um, and then another thing that's, that's really special about this product is where you can apply it. So outdoor, of course, um, and then this one, indoor. So the original Avion Insect Granule label is very, very limited on what you can do indoors. Um, but now you can see that we can apply crack and crevice and void treatments um, indoors. And so that's uh, for food handling and feed handling areas as well. Um, you can use up to two ounces per 10 linear feet. So, you know, this isn't really a kind of product you'd want to scatter all over a, a living space, um, and you can't do that per label, but cracks, crevices, voids, all those places where pests are going to be, you can get this bait directly to them. So for indoor cockroach work, um, indoor ant work, um, this is another tool that you can reach for in your toolbox when the situation warrants. Um, use patterns, you know, we're recommending a structural perimeter band of seven feet that's on the label. Um, you can also do landscape boundaries, um, limited area applications that are those spot treatments to lawns and landscapes. Um, and then you can always put the product in base stations um, and then indoor crack and crevice, void, and you can scatter in crawl spaces and attics that are unoccupied. Um, you can do a perimeter band along walls and crawl spaces and attics and unfinished basements. And then you can always apply in base stations indoors as well. Next, please. Yeah, and then just application, um, easily done with a handheld granule spreader, and I would strongly recommend checking out some of these new battery-operated um, spreaders. They're just super efficient, and it, it can give your, your crew, your, your technicians, uh, a break from some of the hard manual labor that this job usually entails, because it's, it's literally just as easy as walking around the property while you're making that application. Um, so you can also apply perimeter applications around the structure or fence line. Um, those spot treatments are always an option. And, you know, areas you'd really want to hit would be landscape beds, areas where there's mulch or river rock, leaf litter around trees, et cetera. Um, one thing you do need to do is keep this off of pavement and non-porous areas. So it's one of the few restrictions that, that there are here. I think that's it for my slides. Let me see the next one just to be sure. Yeah, so I will go ahead and hand things over to Nikki. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in today and listening to what we had to say. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm assuming that everybody can hear me okay. Um, and thank you so much for joining everybody. Um, so my section, I'm going to be talking about our, our new Advion Insect Granular Bait 2. Um, but I also want to talk about, you know, specifically to a pest ant that is you know, notoriously bad in the territory I cover, which is the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, so I'm going to focus on odorous house ants uh, specifically. Uh, so next slide, please. So I don't think this ant really needs an introduction, um, but just so we're all on the same page. Um, this is an ant that is native to the United States. So keep that in mind that this is a native ant that is, you know, really a, a, a problematic um, pest and, and gives us lots of challenges. Um, it's a small uh, black to, to brown ant. Um, all of the ants, ant workers are the same size. They're monomorphic. 
Um, it's a single note ant, so you know our ants are single or two noted ants. Um, but what's helpful in identification and separating this from, from other small black ants is that single node, and that even you know, that node is actually um, quite flat, that it almost appears to have zero node, so a flat node, and then the, the gaster or that the abdomen um, hangs over the waist, so it also makes it quite difficult um, to see. Um, has your know, characteristics, um, you know, like other ants that are problematic, like the Argentine ants, you know, they can be in huge numbers, um, very fast moving, um, and you know, and, and another um, hint that is helpful for identification is if you crush this ant, it has that distinct odor. Um, some people say rotten coconut. Most often, uh, we get that blue cheese um, smell, but usually, you know, some sort of odor. Um, so again, a, a native ant present through every state in the U.S. and can even be found um, in you know, southern um, Canada and into Mexico as well. Um, so next slide. So you know, every year we see um, these surveys come through our industry magazines, and this one's a couple of years old. But the data here tends to run true from year to year. So this is from PCT Magazine looking at the state of the ant market. And on the left-hand side, the question was, you know, what ant species tend to be problematic in your area? And you can see odorous house ants came in number two just behind carpenter ants. And when I talk to technicians, when I go to visit um, you know, and or give presentations within my territory, I ask the question, you know, does this ring true to you? Is this correct? Are odorous house ants the most problematic for you? And and I would say by far, the answer is always yes. And then if we look at the follow-up question here, so now we know what the top ant, um, ants are, um, you know, what's making the phone ring, um, you know, when it comes to actually controlling that ant, which one was the most difficult to control? And odorous house ants lead the pack about double actually. So if you compare it to Argentine ants, which we know um, are also very problematic to control, um, the response there was 11%, but odorous house ants was at 22%. So what I wanna share with you today is just of the, the little you know, um, bits and bobs, the little um, you know, pieces of the puzzle of the biology and behavior of the odorous house ant that I find is useful. And, and the more we know about our ant pest, you know, I think we're better prepared to find their weaknesses and to better control them. And at the end, I'm also going to show you the advantages of using our new Advion insect granula in controlling um, this particular ant. Uh, so next slide, please. So we're, we're probably all very familiar. So with the odorous house ant, um, you know, they have very strong foraging trails. Um, they have numerous shallow nests. So within a colony, they can have multiple nests, multiple queens. Um, so they can have actually very large colonies. And um, I think what helps me when I think about odorous house ants and why they can be so challenging to control is right here in the Midwest and the Northeast, we have an ant that's capable of being a super colony. We think of super colonies just being out west or in the southeast with like Argentine ants or tawny crazy ants. But here we have this ant, this little old native ant that has these terrible behaviors in the urban environment of being a super colony that is really challenging to control. Um, so these nests can be, you know, outdoors. Um, it can easily nest indoors as well. Um, the nests are, are shallow. They take advantage of natural or man-made voids. So within leaf litter, mulch, um, underneath or within pots. Um, and, and they can be kind of small. So they can be hard to find as well. And we all know you know, if we can find the nest and treat that, we're going to get control even faster. Um, and I would say with our odorous house ants, you know, the, the trails can easily be 100 feet. And you can have multiple nests connected onto that trail. Um, and while they can have these super colony behaviors and interconnecting um, trails and nests, when the foragers are out looking for food, those worker ants don't necessarily take bait or their food back 
to different nests. They might just go to one or just a handful of nests. So what's going to be really important with bait application is we want to treat as many of these foraging trails as possible. And I think with my experience and working with the Advion insect granular bait, with that ease of application, we're getting actually very nice, thorough, um, broad application uh, and getting the product where it needs to be. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is a, a, a slide that I'm showing you here from um, a research study that was conducted at Purdue University. And to me, this was really useful information and um, you know, sort of pulling back the curtain on odorous ha house ant activity. So what we're looking at here is the seasonal abundance of odorous house ant nests in a study plot um, that was approximately three hectares in size. So this was on Purdue campus, um, a very urban environment all around buildings, but lots of uh, vegetation, trees, shrubbery, um, lots of good food sources for the ants as well. So um, uh, this is Dr. Jeshik Bukowski at, at Purdue who is an ant specialist. And they went out and checked, you know, surveyed for ants throughout the year. So at the um, beginning of this study, which was around mid-March, you can see that they only found seven odorous house ant nests in that three hectare area. As the season progressed, you know, they continued and, and checked for those nests. Early April, there was a little bit of growth around 12 nests. Late April, now it's almost a little bit more than doubled. We've got 33 nests. Then we get to early May and our ant numbers have peaked already. It didn't take too long for those odorous house ant nests to start budding, expanding in the area, getting greater coverage over that three hectare area. And that pretty much stayed the same. So we have, you know, 80 or so nests over this area. And it wasn't until the fall that then the numbers start to go down and they go down to, you know, very few nests again. So it's only, you know, once we start getting into the warmer months that they create this sort of super colony effect and get huge in number. And then as it gets colder again, they um, go back to being just a small number of nests. And interestingly enough, they actually tend to go back to the same area during those colder months. And we would assume that the following season that this would happen again. So what's really important to what I think here is ideally, we don't want this peak to happen in the first place. But I think we have a really good argument. Uh, we can have an argument in place here to say that to target these ants from, from peaking, we could do applications in early spring and, and ideally, you know, prevent this explosion from happening. And just another note to make um, what was noted in this research study was around May when this peak happened, what also was happening in the environment was, you know, um, shrubs were coming in and as you know the shrubs were you know leafing back out that uh, a lot of our honeydew producers were exploding in number as well so scales and aphids were in abundance and we saw that correlation with the odorous house ants as well um, with our honeydew producers they're providing a vital sugar source um, for odorous house ants and often um, the ants would actually start budding off and creating nests into that area uh, so next slide, please. And uh, from a different study with the same, uh, some of the same authors at Purdue University, just to show that um, the odorous house ant is actually acting like an invasive species. So recall, you know, this is a native ant and in its natural environment, which is a forested area, it's typically, you know, a, a low key ant, you know, it has a small colony, typically, you know, one nest, uh, one queen and 50 workers. So natural forested area, maybe making its nest in a shelled out acorn. Um, but as you change its environment and, you know, if you go to a semi-natural area, like say a park, um, it, you know, the numbers are, within the colony can get, you know, a, a little bit larger too. And it can actually be a little bit more aggressive to other ants. So when you see the odorous house ant, which is present, which is noted by the lighter 
gray bar in this chart, you get fewer other um, ant species. And if we go back and, and look at that comparison to the natural area, you can see the ant richness in its natural environment is not impacted whether odorous house ant is there or not. But then if we shift over to the right hand side and look in the urban environment, huge difference. Odorous house ant seems to you know, kick out other ant species and become the main player in that environment. And what I find fascinating is um, at, at Purdue, you know, they've documented um, a super colony where they estimated it could have been in the range of 6 million workers and 50,000 queens. Um, I hope that that is unique, that it's not common, and that when we have these super colonies, it's more like in the tens of thousands of workers and thousand, just a few thousand queens. Um, but just a little bit of perspective that you know, we have these challenges and that also that size colony, that's a lot of mouths to feed and that we have to use appropriate quantities of product. Um, so next slide, please. I just want to bring that into perspective in, in you know, what we have to do when we go out and um, target these ants. You know, in an ideal situation, um, you know, we would be targeting these ants early on in the season. So if you look at the theoretical chart on the right hand side of the screen, so that's the number of foraging ants. Once we get into the warmer months, ant activity starts to creep up. So, you know, again, you know, this is just a guide here. This is just a theoretical chart. Um, with odorous house ants, once we start to get into consistent 50 degree days, that's when we start to see activity go up. Um, if we have our, try to target our ants when they're at their peak activity, so in this case is June, July, we've got a lot more mouths to feed. And unfortunately, you know, callback rates or just the phone ringing in general is going to be much greater at that time period. Um, but of course, you know, we know what happens in the real world, you know, like this dotted line that, that you see here might actually represent a new customer calling in July because they're starting to see, you know, significant ant numbers. Um, so we know that we could be targeting the ant when it's at the peak size of its population. We know that we can do it. Um, it's just going to take a little bit more labor and likely, you know, it's going to take um, you know, more product, but incorporating something like a granular bait on top of your gels and your non repellents is going to help get that colony under control. And of course, you know, just pointing to some of the points I have here on the left hand side of the screen, you know, incorporating um, the correction of conducive conditions will always help as well. Um, you know, you know, from removing ideal um, nesting sites. Um, you know, like uh, nesting material that odors house ants like, you know, like mulch, uh, leaf debris, and of, and of course, uh, in bold here with the honeydew producers, if we can target those as well, that will help a great deal. Uh, so next slide, please. And Eric mentioned this um, as well. So this is food source components, which is really important to know when it comes to our ants. Our ants require carbohydrates, protein, and lipids for survival. And they will go through a seasonal cycle on their needs for these products uh, or for these components. Um, so carbohydrates are important for you know, energy requiring activities. Um, about 70% of their carbohydrates can actually come from honeydew producers like aphids and scale insects. Um, protein is essential for you know, reproduction and, and development of eggs and larvae. And for odorous house ants, you know, that can be eating you know, dead insects um, as well as dead animals, you know, such as you know, like dead rodents that might be found in the yard. That can be a source of protein as well. And of course, lipids as well. And I just want to reiterate the point that this new formulation, this Advion insect granular bait meets all of those needs. And the protein source is an exceptional quality level of protein, which I think makes a big difference in the acceptance rate. Um, and that we can call this a true mixed feeder bait, that we can um, put a bait out and that the ants will have carbohydrates, protein, and lipids avail available to them with this, uh, with this bait. Uh, next slide, please.
And you know, those food choices will change throughout the spring. Again, this is just a guide. Um, you know, our, our ants don't read the biology books that we do, um, but typically in the springtime, our ants are typically focused on reproduction, development of the colony, and proteins and lipids become a primary foraging target. I would say with our odorous house ants, odorous house ants are not going to be ready to go on a full keto diet at any given time. Um, our odorous house ants really like sugar all throughout the season, but when they are developing the col colony, their protein level still will go up, um, even though they're still foraging on sweet sources at the same time. Um, so we're meeting that need with the granular bait. Um, and then in the summer and fall, the population is really large. They need more energy as they're foraging for food. And then carbohydrates tend to become a, a bigger target. Uh, so next slide, please. So I want to show you some results uh, where we tested our Advion insect granular bait. And this is working with Dr. Jeshik Bukowski um, at the Department of Entomology at Purdue University. And this was taking our granular bait out into the field, targeting odorous house ants. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> and this was around um, buildings, so a very urban environment, um, very healthy populations of odorous house ants. Um, you know, lots of other competing food sources for the ants from honeydew producers and things like that. Um, we monitor ant activity before application as well as during post application by putting out bait cards, which you'll see on the lower um, right side of the screen. So that's a combination of sugar and protein, a special concoction um, that Dr. Bukowski comes up with. You just put it on a monitoring card and you set that out for about an hour or so, and then you count um, how many ants you have coming to your bait card. But you can see some from some of these images at the top, you know, we've got healthy ant numbers. And I have to admit, I just happened to be wearing my ant watch that day, and it was meant to be, so I had to take a picture of odorous house ants on me while I was wearing an ant watch. I think uh, the fellow bug lovers on the meeting would forgive me for that one. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So robust odorous house ants on campus. And you know, we had not numerous replications where we put out the granular bait as well as areas where we had control plot plots. So this was just the granular bait by itself. We used eight ounces per thousand square foot. We've now landed on six ounces per thousand square foot as our recommendation for ants. Um, but this rate is still well within the label recommendations. And the fact that we were just using the bait by itself, I think actually makes sense in this situation that we went slightly above uh, six ounces per thousand. Um, so as you can see, this is looking at the reduction in the ants over um, a, a 12 week period. And we had a hundred percent reduction throughout that entire period of one application and this was a, actually a two foot band application that we did. So from the building foundation and out approximately two feet is where we applied that bait. And if you look at the controls, the controls are actually going into the negative almost every week. So we know that those ant populations are increasing inside and, and doing just fine until we get to about the last week of the study. And this was, we were now in October. So ant numbers were naturally declining. Um, we started the study in July when the ants were well into their peak activity time. And um, so excellent control that lasted. We didn't see any other ants move into the area. And if we move to the next slide, please, Marshall. Um, so this site was inspected, uh, or these multiple sites were inspected approximately every two weeks. Um, but Dr. Bukowski did go out there on a frequently basis. And I thought this quote from his report was quite astounding, that with the Advion insect granular bait, he found it to be very fast acting, and he saw that decline in the ant activity go down within 24 hours of application. And within three days, he wasn't seeing any more ants, and that 100% control remained for the duration of the 14-week study. So next slide, please. And, you know, I, I really enjoy getting to work with our, our research cooperators and that they have the, the, the flexibility to, to look at some of our, in our products. 
um, in, in different ways. And I thought this was an interesting an email that I received um, from Jeshik uh, earlier this year. He took one piece of our Advion insect granular base, so just one granule, and placed it in one of his lab colonies, which easily contained 10,000 plus workers and multiple queens. After 96 hours, he counted 750 dead ants, and he calculated based on that rate of six ounces per thousand had the potential to kill 23 million odorous house ants. So I thought that was fun. Next uh, slide, please. And just a video to show you too. So this is also a video um, through Purdue University. And this is a lab colony, and this is the Advion insect granular bait being placed inside that lab colony. And there's there's queens and brood here, as well as ten, you know uh, ten thousand plus workers. So a very healthy colony. And this is a time lapsed video. Um, so this is a two hour time lapse. And what's compelling here is you know odorous house ants are a small ant, but they have no issues, no challenges here in picking up the pieces of granular bait. Um, unfortunately, it looks like the video is slowing a little bit on my end, um, and, and I don't know if it will catch up with us here. Um, but this video is going to be on our website at syngentapmp.com, and I highly um, you know, recommend taking a look. But the ants cleared out the bait and transported it um, to their nest site. So those black circular devices you would have seen on the right hand side of the screen is where the brood and the queens were. And that when um, Dr. Pekowski went to uh, reevaluate that, that the workers were all dead, the brood was dead, and the queens were also dying and on their way out as well. And all of the um, bait granules had actually been stored inside of those, um, air, those little uh, um, nests that, th that they were using. Um, so I think next slide, I think that might be my last slide, Marshall. Uh, we can forward just to, to double check. And again, oh, and again, that video is on our website as well. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Chris. And thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chris Kiefer. And uh, just for those of, of you that don't know me, I am uh, stationed in College Station, Texas. And uh, today we're going to continue to look at Avion Insect Granule. And we're going to look at a trial with the, the new Avion Insect Granule on Oriental cockroaches and house crickets. Next slide. So this was a lab uh, bioassay that was set up, like I said, with Oriental cockroaches and house crickets that we used uh, shoebox type arenas with the dimensions given there, uh, that the insects were provided with food and harborage. There were uh, 10 oriental cockroaches in, in each replication, uh, represented by five females, five males, and then 20 house crickets in, in the other study in, in separate um, shoeboxes, if you will. There were five reps per treatment, and uh, the treatments were introduced along with fresh uh, alternative food. So the uh, insects did have a choice in this particular bioassay. And uh, we defined mortality for this trial as probing the insect. And if the insect moved, then you know it was considered morbid and not dead. So our, our definition of mortality for this particular trial was very strict. Next. The treatments, uh, what we wanted to really look at in this trial was how does the, the new Advion Insect Granule formulation hold up in, in uh, moisture type con conditions? So we wanted to rate uh, dew cycles. And so we, we did that with uh, treatments two and four were aged with no dew and they were kept in uh, an refrigerator at 45 degrees Fahrenheit and 45 degrees relative humidity. But treatments three and five were aged with dew. And so that cycle started at 5 p.m. and ended at 8 a.m. So 15 total hours, and those treatments were held in the, in the uh, refrigerator at 45 degrees Fahrenheit with 99 degrees, 99% uh, relative humidity. And then we had uh, some post-due events um, for, for some of the treatments. 
where we, we literally sprayed them with a uh, handheld mist sprayer with just water. And, and those were held at 85 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. So again, we just wanted to see how the bait interacted with moisture and uh, dew cycles and if that would have an effect on the efficacy. Next slide. So this is the data from, from that uh, trial setup. This is oriental cockroaches. The x-axis uh, down there on the bottom horizontal axis is days after exposure. The y-axis is the average or, or mean cumulative mortality through time. And so we have the control, which is that, that bottom uh, line down there. There was minimal uh, mortality in the controls. But if you start to look at the treatments here, the other three lines, you can see the avian insect granular uh, bait aged, but no dew. We had avian insect granular bait aged with the five dew cycles, and then we had that fresh bait. And you can see that there was really no effect on, uh, with the uh, dew cycles on efficacy. So if you go out to about five days, we have you know, somewhere between 20 and 30% mortality. Moved to seven days, we're 80 to 90% mortality for all the treatments. And then 10 days, we're at that 90 plus percent mortality, which is where you really want to be with these baits at, at that time frame. So really good efficacy and the, the dew cycles are not uh, showing any negative effect on the bait. Next. So when we looked at our objectives, we wanted to determine if Adyon insect going granular bait killed more than 90% of the target pest within uh, seven to 14 days, the answer was yes. The other objective determined if Adyon insect granular bait exposed to five dew cycles was equally efficacious uh, to bait that was not exposed to the dew cycles or to fresh bait. And we clearly showed that in this, uh, in this trial. Next. This is the uh, house crickets or field crickets in that same exact setup. Again, the, the, the axes are the same days after exposure on the x-axis mean percent mortality on the y-axis. And then the different bars represent uh, the different treatments there. So again, you can see the controls were less than 10% mortality throughout the entire trial, which is what you wanna see. And then uh, the different colored bars representing the different treatments. One day after exposure, uh, all the, the treatments were at or above 70%. And you can just move through there and you can see the linear mortality start to take place. And when you get out to seven days, we're at 90, 95, 100% mortality with, with all of those treatments. So again, there was little to no effect on, with these dew cycles on the efficacy of this bait on crickets. Next. So going back to the, the, the same objectives there, the adjunct insect granular bait did kill 100% of the pests within seven days. And uh, we did show that uh, the FC was not uh, negatively affected by the dew cycles as opposed to fresh bait and then the, the bait that was uh, exposed to the dew cycles. Next. Well, another uh, quick trial I wanted to share. This is on American cockroaches and field crickets. And this, is, again, was a lab trial done at Texas A&M University. Next. So this was a, a very similar setup with the, those shoe boxes that you can see in the, uh, in the picture over there on the left, uh, 30 by 15 by 10 centimeter shoe boxes. The insects were provisioned with harborage and uh, a diet and water. And then uh, 10 adult male or female non-gravid insects for the case of the cockroaches were, were put in there. Once they were put into that arena, they were allowed to acclimate to that arena for 24 hours. And then after that 24 hour period, we're, we removed the diet and then placed the, the granular treatments in the arenas with the insects. Next. So the treatments for this particular trial were the, ad, the new adjunct insect granular bait which is in doxycarb, and uh, we wanted to get uh, some, some data on uh, against lavalor granular bait, which is hydromethanol and, and imidacloprid, so a dual active ingredient. So each arena received a three grams of bait in a wave boat, 
And we wanted to look at consumption and to see if the insects were, were removing bait and, and moving it out of that way boat. And so we removed all the, uh, the way boats after 24 hours, weighed them, and then put them back into the arenas so we could get an idea of if they're moving this bait around even within 24 hours. And then after, uh, at that 20, at four hours and then 24 hours post treatment, and then daily after that, we took mortality readings. And mortality again was recorded um, as if the insect were probed and there's no movement. Next. So this is the, the data for the American cockroaches. Again, the, the x-axis is time post-treatment, and then y-axis is the mean percent mortality of the cockroaches. So pre-trial, everybody's at zero. The um, untreated controls were, had minimal mortality throughout uh, 10 days, which is what you wanna see. But if you jump out to four days, you can see both products are there, you know, around 40 to 45%. And then at day five, both products are at 50%. And then day six is where the adjuvant insect granular, granular bait starts to separate itself from the other treatment. And that trend continued all the way out to 10 days, where at day 10, we had 100% mortality. The lava lore was at 78%. And then those untreated controls were at 2%. Next. This is the, the same uh, setup, same trial. This is with crickets. And again, uh, same uh, graph setup or figure setup, if you will. And you can see that uh, at time zero, you know, 0% mortality. Day two, the adjuvant insect granular bait had caused 94% mortality in the crickets. Uh, Larvalor was at 22%. So we really separated ourselves there at day two. And that trend continued all the way out through day 10. Uh, larva lore, you know, day three, 52. At day four, larva lore at 62%, but then avion insect granular was already at 100% mortality. Uh, by day 10, you know, we're still at 100, and uh, larva lore is only at 80% mortality. So really uh, highly palatable bait, and, and it's got that great uh, food components in it, like Nikki had talked about, where we have all three key components that insects may be looking for at different times of the year. Next. So just a quick summary of that trial, American cockroaches uh, with the uh, Advion insect granular bait reached 100% mortality. The, the larva lore granular bait was only at 78% at 10 days. And then field crickets, uh, larva lore 62% at four days and 80% at 10 days and uh, adjunct insect granular reached that 100% mark with the uh, field crickets at four days. So really outperformed uh, the larva lore in both of these trials. And then uh, adjunct insect granular bait was significantly different statistically uh, than larva lore at six days on the American cockroaches and four days with the field crickets. And that trend continued throughout the trial for, for this um, lab trial at Texas a and Next. So this is a uh, video here that was done by uh, Dr. Buskowski at Purdue. And uh, these are American cockroaches and he's got them set up there in, in their natural arena. He's gonna go in and, and put in some uh, adjunct insect granular bait and the cockroaches just start feasting on it. And this is time-lapsed. So we're about at one hour right here. And you can see they, they, they really never stop feeding on it. They keep going back to it. This is two days later, uh, massive mortality, significant mortality. And, and you see that, that twitching of, of the cockroach there, which is kind of normal uh, activity when, when they've uh, fed on a toxicant. So really good uh, data there for multiple pests, uh, cockroaches and crickets. And then uh, the videos are, are very telling in that aspect as well.